Lord, we're just so thankful for this day. Lord, we're thankful that we can come into your house to serve you, to learn about you, Father, where some countries, they're being persecuted for that. Lord, we're just, we're just so thankful that we can walk in freely and, and walk out. And Lord, it's, just a, it's a great thing to be able to serve you uh, each and every day, Father. And I just pray, Father, today, again, if there's not one here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, before they walk out of this church, they will come to know you in a real way. Father, and as Christians, we need to be more committed to you. We need to uh, look at what God has put in his word and shown us that times are coming. And, Father, yes, we don't know what that day is, but, Father, we can look at the signs of the times, Father. And I just uh, thankful for this group that came up here today, so thankful that they uh, made this uh, trip out here to come and play for us. Father, just, I just pray that you would bless them. And, uh, and I say this in, all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Thank amen. You. Connie, Marilyn and Connie. Thanks again, ladies. And they'll be up here one more time, right? Merry Christmas, everybody. We have a birthday tomorrow. I'm going to do. Uh, Jeff, you want to leave me in singing happy birthday? No. <laughs> Tom O'Farrell's birthday is on Christmas. So, Eric, why don't you open it up since you can sing well. Let's sing, Mary, let's sing happy birthday to Tom O'Farrell. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Tom. Happy birthday to you. 
Merry, Merry Christmas and happy birthday. So when you were going to get a present at Christmas time, they just said, let's get them two, and the second one will be for your birthday, right? Is that how it worked? <laughs> you were kind of overshadowed, weren't you? Wow. Yeah, that would be rough. I mean, but that's great. So you're kind of a little bit overshadowed there, Tom. Pray for uh, John Clayson. He's not feeling well. He's been struggling for a couple days. Um, and also Jessica Combs has surgery tomorrow, or the 26th, I should say. Um, is that it? Everybody ready? It seems like a hushed <laughs> sense this morning. There was a man who was approached to write an animated special by CBS executives. It was going to air on December of 1965. And his comic strips had become a fixture amongst American people all the way back to October of 1950. So CBS wanted to capitalize on the popularity of this comic strip. Some of you remember Sunday mornings, I, the colored comic strips you used to see. Growing up as a kid without color television, that's the only color we ever got. <laughs> it's like, wow, look at all that color. I thought the world was in black and white. And man, you get up and read the Sunday comics, and CBS approached this man and said, you know, we want to we want to make some money off you. And they had their reasons for this because the, the previous year, the, one of the rival networks, NBC, had aired the Christmas special Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in 1964, and it met great success. And these were the days stuff would only appear once on television. You didn't get to watch it at any time, any day, any time. It was, it was for habitual viewers and people that wanted to watch things at a certain time, and this would be a one-time thing. Um, and for several years already, ABC, the other network, had a show called The Flintstones that aired during prime time, a half-hour animated sitcom. So you, some of you may remember that. So CBS wanted a piece of the pie. And the man they approached said he would put together the program, but it was contingent on it had to include the true story of Christmas. The man was Charles Schultz, creator of the Peanuts comic strip. And he insisted on the core purpose that of the Charlie Brown Christmas would be the story of Christmas. And he said that, why bother doing it if it does not? The producer-director was Lee Mendelson, and he, uh, he said, are you sure, Charles, that you want to do this? And he said, Schultz did, if we don't do it, who will? Who will? To Coca-Cola's credit, they were the main sponsor for the show. They did not pull away from it. CBS fought him against it, but he insisted on having Linus reading from the book of Luke. And it was, it became, as according to one writer for the New York Times, the most magical two minutes in all of TV animation. Half the nation would watch it that night on December 10th, 1965. It's been airing ever since. It's been airing ever since. The passage Linus read is in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start with that in a minute. Let's bow our heads and, and get our hearts ready. Dear Lord, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for us seeing some folks uh, today that we haven't seen for a while. Lord, watch over uh, those that could not make it. I think of John Clayson with his illness. Watch over... Jessica Combs, she has surgery coming up on Tuesday. Father, thank you for your love for us. Uh, be with those that are struggling with their families. It seems like this time of year, family problems strike a lot, and with everything wanting to be so perfect, and then we have some family friction. Lord, I just pray that you'll quiet our hearts, let our minds be away from all the different thoughts of all these things that really don't matter, but to focus on you and you alone, and all God's people said. Linus started on verse 7 or 8, I believe, but we're going to start with verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone, into his own city. So there was a puppet in Rome during those days. 
and his name was Caesar Augustus. I'll explain that in a minute. Like Charles Schultz, was used by God, as Charles Schultz was used by God to spread his word across millions of homes, Augustus, albeit a pagan emperor, issued a decree which would result in a young Jewish couple getting to a place at just the time that was prophesied 700 years before. God used a wicked man to bring upon his doing. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Charles Schultz, a Christian, was used by God. Now God was using a pagan man. The fullness of time had come. Born Gaius Octavian, Caesar Augustus on top of the world, his great uncle, Julius Caesar, had named him heir of the Roman Republic. He took over reign in 27 BC. He was given the title Augustus, meaning the majestic one. They so honored him that the eighth month of the year was named after him. His leadership over the Roman Empire burgeoned, and there came a time during this era of what was called or known as Pax Romana, which was a worldwide peace. He stabilized taxes and income throughout the empire. He enlarged the roads that became so vast. Some of the roads still exist today. I think the Summit County Road Department can learn from the Romans or the Ohio Department of Transportation, if you've seen the mess on Route 8. He was so successful that 25 years later, he, he celebrated a silver jubilee. That would have been 2 B.C., the Roman Senate bestowed on him the honor of the father of the country. And as a part, we believe historically, as a part of this Silver Jubilee, his 25th anniversary, he issued an edict that all the world be taxed. And in doing so, a census was taken. Every Roman, every member of the Roman Empire, and it was vast, there was a map behind me that showed you the vastness of the Roman Empire, would have to swear allegiance to Caesar. But by issuing this decree, Caesar Augustus set in, motions, uh, set in motions events that would compel a poor carpenter in Nazareth to load up his betrothed pregnant wife and travel 80 miles down the Jordan River Valley. The fullness of time had come. God was using Caesar Augustus to accomplish his will. God can use people in your life. It says, if a man's play, ways please the Lord, even his enemies shall be at peace with him. The world would see Joseph and Mary as victims of circumstance, forced to comply with this wicked king's credo. Yet it was the hand of God, and think of that in your life, it was the hand of God manipulating these mighty Roman administrators to do his bidding, all the while giving them the impression that it was their own idea. I think of the book of Esther, where God was working behind the scenes for the Jews, and his name is not mentioned. The name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. But God was working behind bringing Esther to become a person of prominence and to save the Jews from annihilation on the hands of Haman. And Joseph also went up, verse 4, from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was a house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. The city of David. Why was it called the city of David? It was where David was from. Let's go back to the story of Ruth, the book of Ruth. Naomi had a husband and two boys. When a famine hit, she did not ask God or her husband, Elimelech, where they should go. They decided to go to Moab, where God would have had prohibited them to do so. They stayed there for 10 years, and during that time, both of the boys, Malon and Chilan, uh, received wives. Before the 10 years was over, all three were dead. Her husband and her two sons-in-laws were dead. They decided at that time to come back to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem. One of her daughters-in-laws decided to stay home, Orpah. But Naomi famously said, your God will be my God and my, your people will be my people. And Ruth 
followed her mother-in-law home. She came back to nothing, to barrenness. One day she told her daughter-in-law to go out and glean in the fields. There was a mechanism that God provided in his law that poor people can glean the fields on the edges from the prosperous folks, and they would be able to take what was left over, so to speak. And in doing so, she went there, it says, by hap. In other words, some people would say by hap and chance. But she went out in the fields that day on the bequest of the behest of her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she met a man named uh, Boaz. And God, miraculously working behind the scenes, caused these two to be married. Boaz became her kinsman redeemer. And through that union, that marriage union, Boaz and Ruth had a little boy named Obed. And that boy, Obed, had a boy named Jesse. And that boy, Jesse, had a boy named David. It's the city of David that they would come. They were of the lineage of this tribe of Judah. And they head down there some 80 miles with a pregnant woman in tow. Now, when it says they went up from Galilee, if you look at the map behind me, Judea sits to the south of Galilee. Wouldn't that be down? We would say if we're going to Virginia, we're going down to Virginia, right, Norm, or West Virginia? We'd say we're going down in the holler. The reason they said up is because of the elevation of the land there. We sit in Talmadge right now on 1,000 feet of elevation approximately. Nazareth was about 1,100 feet in elevation. Traveling to Bethlehem, they get up to 2,500 feet in elevation. Could you imagine traveling what took probably a week, because they wouldn't travel on the Sabbath, 80-some miles with a pregnant espoused wife across terrain that reached 15, 1,400 feet higher in elevation from once they left. It was a fullness of time. It was a fullness of time. They were there not because of Augustus' decree, because they were there because God's scripture said they will be there. They were there because Bible prophecy said there they would be there. Think about that in your life, when maybe some people come in and try to influence your life in a negative way. The Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God has a plan for you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. He has a plan for you. He says in Romans 8, all things work together for the good that are in Christ Jesus. And in this particular time in history, the fullness of time had come. And even though this trail seemed arduous, they didn't have convenient marks along the way. God took them there because the fullness of time had come and it had been preordained in Scripture that Mary and Joseph would be in that little town of Bethlehem because it was 700 years before this in Micah chapter 5 that Micah the prophet uh, spoke this way. He says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. You see, Jesus Christ was there at the creation of the earth. He said, let us make man in our own image, our. The Holy Trinity, the Trinity was there, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But Christ came in flesh, Emmanuel. He came in flesh, that's what that means. Here he was in the fullness of time, and the Jews were ripe for their desire for a Messiah because they were under the throes of the Roman Empire. The whole world desired a Messiah. And in this time, Mary and Joseph arrived. In verse 6 it says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Charles Schultz was a native of Minneapolis, Minnesota, a hardy man, as you had to be, coming from that city. He demanded that his Christmas story that he presented to CBS would have room for Luke chapter 2. Yet the majority of people today, even Christians, professing Christians, make little provision of Christ in their lives today. Is there room in your heart today for Jesus? Uh, a man in our jail ministry on Tuesday night once approached me, and he says, what does it mean in Matthew 
when it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew 6.33. The majority of people have no idea what it means to seek the kingdom of God first. Let me ask you this today. Like that thief on the cross, he called him Lord, the one that accepted him. He said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Is he the Lord of your life? You know, you could be a Christian but be so far away from the devil that no one even will know you're a Christian because he's anything but the Lord of your life. Everything else comes first. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We don't talk too much about this, but church attendance is a part of that because you should want to be with God's people. Naomi, a Ruth said, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. I saw someone post something on Facebook the other day. It says you can watch online, but then, you know, when you go home sometimes, you play those fires on your television, it looks so cozy, and they have the crackling sound, but you don't get the warmth, do you? You don't get the warmth. They look awfully pretty, man, but there's no warmth. When you're in the house of God, you get that warmth, Amen. Praise the Lord. Where would you rather be than in the house of God? The majority of people don't understand. There was a young man that came up to the Lord one day, and he says, Master, I will follow you everywhere I go, or everywhere you go. And we get a lot of people like that. I'll do anything. I'll, 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 I'll profess your name, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll offer up alms in your name. And he told that man that said, I will follow you wherever you go. I'll make you the Lord of my life, as many seek to do. But don't. He said in Matthew 8, 20, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You know, from the first moment he came in flesh, Jesus Christ had no comfortable place to, to lay his head. He had no, no comfortable place. Remember Jacob who, who built that, the pillows out of rocks when he was there? One day in the place they called Bethel. Jesus Christ had no comfortable place to lay his head because the shepherds back then would, especially the Bethlehem shepherds, would make mangers hewn out of stone for protection, not for comfort, for protection. The first night our Savior lived, he had no soft place, and he went to the cross having no soft place to raise his head. Will you follow him in spite of not having a soft place to lay your head? We're in a comfort society. Everybody seeks creature comforts. Of some generations, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said in 1936 in his second acceptance speech in Philadelphia, some generations more is expected, some is primarily given to. Our generation has been one that hasn't been much expected of. And we see the results of that. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. Christ told that man, if you're willing to make room for me, you better, if you're going to follow me, you must first deny yourself, take up your cross, and, and lose your life. J James Elliott said, he is no fool that, to, to lose what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose, back in 1956. If you lose your life for the Lord, you will truly gain it. When Abraham offered Isaac up that day in Genesis chapter 2, God wanted to see if he was willing to lose his beloved firstborn son, his truly firstborn son. This was the child of promise. Ishmael was a child of his flesh. He was so willing to do so that he climbed up Mount Moriah and offered up his son. Are we willing to give him everything in our lives? Are we willing to make room for him like Charles Schultz made room for that Luke chapter 2 and it reached multitudes of people, multitudes of people since 1965. Half of the country and the Nielsen's ratings exploded that night watching that special. And there were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold... I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Charles Schultz wrote something very interesting into his comic that was animated in 1965. When Linus, who always held a blanket, read the Christmas story, when he spoke the words, fear not, he dropped the blanket. It doesn't say in Scripture, but I would think that possibly it was Gabriel that appeared to the shepherds that night. 
because when Zacharias in the temple, and he told him, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a long-awaited baby, told Zacharias, fear not. Months later, he approached Mary, and he told her she would bear him that would be called Christ the King. His name shall be called Jesus, as prophesied in Isaiah. And Gabriel told Mary, fear not. Now here with these shepherds, he says, fear not. This gospel story is about following him with no fear. I remember Eric, my buddy over there, once said he would take on hell with a water pistol. And I believe he would. <laughs> He's that fiery. Why wouldn't it be that the greatest news ever told, the greatest proclamation ever made, why wouldn't it be that God used this report and gave this report to shepherds? Has he not, from the beginning of time, used the foolish things of the world to confound the wise? It seems people that are low in estate seem to be more responsive to the word of God. Have you noticed that? People that seemingly have everything going their way seem less receptive to God's word. I love people of low estate because they're ripe for the gospel and they know that they need a savior. Paul wrote in the book of Corinthians, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world. And things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why God often chose to elevate shepherds in the ministry. It was a shepherd, Moses, that saw the burning bush. It was Jacob's family that came to Egypt, and they were told not to tell Pharaoh what their occupation was because they were lowly shepherds. It was David, a shepherd, that was in the field that day when Samuel came to anoint a king. God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Don't think your voice cannot be heard when it comes to the oracles of God. Amen. Normally, the birth of a prince would be announced to dignitaries, but not in this case. It was the lowly outskirts of society. By then, at this time in our history, people had started to move to the cities. Shepherds were on the outskirts of the city, and they didn't smell too good. They were such that they were not allowed to even be a witness in a hearing. But now here, God chooses to have them witness the greatest thing. And we believe these shepherds were not just any shepherds watching over just over any sheep. We believe these Bethlehem shepherds were there to watch the very sheep that would become the sacrifice during the time of Passover. Behold, the Lamb of God, said John the Baptist to his cousin, that taketh away the sins of the world. That place that Naomi and Elimelech, Elimelech fled due to famine, the name in Hebrew is the house of bread. And it was this place on these fields, known for the rich grain, known where the great harvest would come, where the sheep were freely allowed to graze on these fields and enjoy their fullness. Amen? And it was this flock, these shepherds at this time, that God chose to give this, this great proclamation. Isn't it ironic that the shepherds' names aren't mentioned Shepherds without no names were given the proclamation of him that whose name would be above every name would come. Amen? And this shall be a sign unto you. Verse 12. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. You know why people struggle at Christmas time? Because they don't have peace in their heart. God says, I'll give you the peace that passes all understanding. You have to make peace with God before you can make peace with men. And that's why our nation so is laborious towards peace, because they have no peace in their heart. Let's have peace with God by what he did for us on the cross, sending his son, and then we'll have peace with men. Seek that first in your households. Meanwhile... As the shepherds looked on, 
Mary was holding Jesus tight. And I'm going to have my daughter Katie come up and sing one of our Christmas favorites called Mary, Did You Know? Written by Mark Lowry and performed so well during our years here. Katie? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels strive and when you kiss your little baby you've kissed the face of god mary did you know The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises Did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know? Your baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb, and the sleeping child you're holding, he's the great Thank you, Brandon and Katie. Thank you. It was a fullness of time had come.
We know this could be a difficult time of year for many because you think about the person that's not there with you. But just take heart to know that one day we will all sit at the marriage feast of the Lamb together as believers in one place, all together the bride of Christ there. And Christ himself will gird himself up and serve us at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Could you imagine that? The Lord Jesus serving us. What a delight that will be. I think it was last Sunday I came home and I was playing some Christmas music. And I forget which Christmas song it was. I think Bing Crosby was singing. And I started singing a little bit. And then a female voice came in just then. And it sounded just like my mom. And I said, is that my mom singing with me? And I started, it it teared me up. And I know what it's like, but take heart to know that we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he was, he's living, no matter what men can say. And those angels that told those shepherds that news went away from the shepherds. And in verse 15, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which had come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told of them concerning this child. And all that they had heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen as it was told unto them. Jesus, when he last spoke to his disciples, he said, go ye into all the world. That's what we're to do today. That commission is still applicable to us today to tell others as many as, many as we know about Jesus Christ. Pray for opportunities to present the gospel. Born was he, Isaiah was spoke of more than 500 years before when he said in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And that time will come when he reigns during his millennial kingdom. Aren't you glad he's king of kings and he will reign from Jerusalem and his government in the next verse, in verse 7, it says it will never end. This world we have now is full of corruption, but one day they shall not hurt nor destroy on all of his holy mountain. And everything will run through Jerusalem during this millennial period. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Remember that today if you struggle with missing someone. Know that you're just going through this world. It's not what you're going through, we tell people at the jail. It's what you're going to, amen? He says he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't keep you in the valley. One day you'll see your loved ones in Christ. If you don't know him today, there was a man that came up to Roy yesterday at a homeless dinner over at uh, uh, Middlebury Chapel. His name's Matt. And he went up to Roy and says, okay, I'm going to quote you some verses. And one of the verses he sought to quote to Roy was Romans 10:13. And it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there's one today here that does not know Christ as their Savior, he came, was born, and he lived. He went through everything like you. He was like tempted as you were. He could have come as a a grown man, but he came as a child. If you don't know Christ today, accept him freely. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This week, this coming year, next week we're going to have a a commission for you to go out and tell others about the Lord. This coming year, let him find you so doing. You don't know when the last time you're going to ever have to tell someone about Jesus. Christ in your heart is the only Jesus some people are ever going to see if they don't darken the doors of church. Let them see Christ inside you. Those shepherds went with haste, and they told everyone they know, glorifying, praising God for all the things they've heard and seen. If we're mopey this time of year, And I know it's tough. I had a friend the other day I went out to breakfast with that he's struggling. He has Parkinson's disease, and he's going through a tremendous amount. And I told him, I said, listen, if we're caught up in our troubles, there may be be someone in that next booth that we need to to tell Christ about. If, uh, If the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall the earth be salted? Our time will come. Our rest will come. 
We will be with our loved ones forever. Grow weary not in well-doing. Think about what the Lord came for, and let's give our lives in service to him and seek him first. Seek him first. Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your love for us. Father, I just pray that you would hearten the believers today. Lord, the church is for the edifying and the building up of the saints and to equip them for service as they go out. Lord, this is our barracks. This is the church. This is the body of Christ. We're to be sent out into the world, Father. Let's go into the highways and byways and not hesitate to tell others about you. Father, this world is a struggle. If there's one here today, Father God, that doesn't know you, I come to you in your son's name. Lord, if there's one here today, let them accept you freely today as we play our closing song, as our ladies come up. And Lord, I just pray that you would hearten Christians that are here today. Let them not think about the travails of this world. Let them think about the time that they will reign with you. You said, know you not that you would judge angels or judge others? Lord, Christians will be sitting in places of prominence in your kingdom. Lord, watch over us today. Bless and keep us. In your holy name we pray and all God's people say, amen. We have our ladies perform a final number. And by the way, I'm going to have little Mar uh, Isaac. I think Isaac's around somewhere in, in Corbin. Hold two plates on the back. We're going to take a free will offering for these ladies. I think I told you about it last week uh, just for their time they spent here today. Marilyn and Connie, thank you. <laughs>